Let us quiet ourselves in preparation for worship. Carol, a beautiful musical reminder of the beauty of our earth and of the brotherhood and beauty of our country. Um, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship on Memorial Day weekend. Today we remember those who have given their lives for our earthly freedom and worship the one who died and rose to ensure our eternal freedom. Good morning. Good morning, Bob. Uh, 
As far as the news and ministry, uh, you'll find on the back of the bulletin, uh, notice there's a sign-up sheet to help deliver meals uh, on the table at the back. Also, uh, Ecumenical Vacation Bible School will be coming up in a, uh, July 31st through August 3rd, and crew leaders and helpers are needed, and if you'd like to help, uh, please contact the church office or Amanda Branson. The Gathering Hymn is In My Life, 468 in Glory to God. Friends, we've done this before, so I think what I'll do, since there are four verses to this, is begin, and whenever you feel like jumping in, do so. The water's fine. Join me in the responsive call to worship. The Lord is King. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlines be glad. His righteousness and all the people behold his glory. Light dawns for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord and give thanks to his holy name. In the presence of the Lord, we worship and rejoice. The hymn of praise is God reigns, let earth rejoice, number 365 in glory to God.
proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. With such assurance, we need not fear confession, but simply draw near in honesty and trust to our loving God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have have gone gone along with the ways of the world and and failed failed to give him glory. Forgive Forgive us and and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world in love, peace, mercy, and forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the responsive assurance of God's grace. The saying is true and worthy of full acceptance. That Christ died to save sinners. Friends, Believe the promise of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Bob, thanks for your help this morning. And Carol, thank you for playing and inspiring us with your music. I invite you to join your hearts and minds and spirits together with me in a moment of prayer. O God, as we fully experience the good news of Easter and look forward to the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, open our hearts and minds to your word dwelling within us. Call us once again, our deepest, most true and best selves, to unity in Christ. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible passage this morning, friends, is taken from the end of the 17th chapter of John's Gospel. Now, in John's Gospel, the entire 17th chapter is devoted to one thing. Jesus praying on behalf of his disciples. That prayer takes different focuses and has different parts, but but in essence, it is Jesus before his crucifixion and resurrection praying for the future of his disciples in such a way that they will be guided and protected and inspired by his risen spirit in the future as they minister in his name. from the 17th chapter, starting at verse 20 and ending in verse 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, as you Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. 
and these know you that ha you have sent me. I made your name known to them all, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. I've been thinking about the appropriately named competition, tug of war. Tug of war. Two sides, one rope, a line on the ground, and have at it. Pull for all your worth in opposite directions. And I've decided that I'm not, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan of tug of war. I once watched a match on an elementary school playground, and of course it was between the boys and the girls. Boys on one side, girls on the other side, and they pulled and it went back and forth and back and forth. Both sides determined to win and neither side willing to give an inch. But the girls, as usual, were smarter. The anchor of the girls' team at the end took the end of the rope and tied it to a leg support of the playground equipment. And the boys just kept pulling and pulling and finally gave one tremendous, great, frustrated last tug and the rope broke. Back and forth and back and forth and the rope broke with no winners. I think that's why I'm not a big fan. Tug of war feels just like that. Energy spent on a conquest with no real winners. Hmm? You may be wondering why I've been thinking about such a curious thing as tug of war. Well, for two reasons. One was the emergence that came during a Zoom coaching call with one of the people that I'm coaching. They are new to a community that they've just moved into. They are new to a different church. And they are new to a role that they are fulfilling for the larger church that comes with quite a few responsibilities. And so a lot of people in the church are looking to this person to save everything. And the person confessed to me that she feels like she's in the middle of a tug of war. Oh, not just with one rope with a lot of different ropes being held by a lot of different people with their own agenda that are pulling in different directions without bothering to listen to each other or to imagine what they might be asked to let go of for the good of everyone. Do you know what I mean by that? pulling in their own direction, regardless of whatever else is going on around them. She says that it's kind of an exciting time, but it's also very difficult and very challenging because she feels like she's in the middle of a tug of war and being pulled in so many different directions. Doesn't sound like fun to me. Forget fun. I don't even know how you serve in a situation where there are multiple tug of wars going on all the time. Multiple tug of wars going on. Does that sound familiar? 
Does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound like a situation that we might be familiar with? How many institutions, how many groups in our culture could we name right off the top of our head that seem to be locked in a tug of war? Both sides determined to win, neither side willing to give an inch. And where does that get us? Nowhere. And that's the other reason that I've been thinking about tug of war. Because of overhearing Jesus pray for us. And his prayer for us is, is nothing close to being good at tug of war. In fact, it's the opposite. Jesus prays for us to become skilled and open to pulling in the same direction as his followers and friends. Did you overhear him too? Praying for you? Praying for us? I ask that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. What does that mean? It's unity. It's unity and oneness. It's an understanding of identity and a will and the power to pull together as a way of showing the world who Jesus is, what he is up to, and why Jesus was among us in the first place. I take a lot of hope from this particular passage and from the reality that Jesus prays for us because I believe that God answers prayer. I believe that prayer is a powerful thing and that God answers prayer. God answers your prayers. God answers Jesus' prayer. And God's answer to prayer is always in keeping with God's activity for the well-being of all. God's answers to prayer will be anti-tug-of-war answers. You can count on that. So if we're determined to play tug of war, we might just miss the answer. It's unity. And that should not be mistaken for or misunderstand as uniformity. That should not be understood as sameness, because all we have to do is look around us and we realize that we are not the same. We are different people that come from different places with different gifts, and we are brought together in a calling that serves God's purposes and makes us the best we can be. It's not sameness. It's the gifts that we share pulling in the same direction so that the world around us knows that God loves them deeply and completely. That a witness is given to a Savior, Jesus, who loves in such a way that has no dependent clauses as if or when or when you finally get it together, then I will, but unconditionally, no matter what, all the time. That kind of love should be evident through our pulling together. But there are some things that 
There's some things that work, <laughs> that work against us in this. There is convergence and collectivism, and then there's divergence and individualism, and we know both of those. Convergence and collectivism is like the common good. You might have heard from a previous generation about how during World War II, so many people pulled together in the same direction and played their part because they saw that as a way of getting through, as a way of playing their part so that everyone was better. And they did all kinds of things to prove that and to live that out. That's convergence, that's collectivism, that's understanding that we're better together with each of us playing our part toward a common good, a common goal. Is there a downside to that? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. See, the downside of convergence and collectivism is that you have to be like us in order to be a part of the group. And if you're not like us, then you're not a part of the group. A part of the downside of that is fear of the other, xenophobia. A part of that is judgmentalism. Against someone else for them just being who they are. You can't be one of us because you are not like us. You don't think like us. You don't believe like us. Therefore, it can easily become exclusive. Not long ago, NBC News covered a story where a 15-year-old girl was kicked out of her Christian school. She was kicked out of her Christian school for having a birthday. Well, more specifically, she was kicked out of her Christian school because at her birthday, she had a birthday cake with a rainbow on it. And she was wearing a rainbow shirt. And her mom took a picture of her with her cake in her shirt and put it on Facebook. And the next thing you know, she's kicked out of school because the school authorities saw that as a threat. God's sign of the rainbow, God's unconditional love for all of creation, for all of time, interpreted as a threat. An innocent thing like a birthday cake and a shirt got her kicked out of school. That's the downside of collectivism, judgmentalism, exclusion. That's not what Jesus meant. And there's individualism. We know that. We all have our gifts. We all bring things to the table, right? Is there a downside to that? Yes, the downside to that is narcissism. The downside to that is I'm going to get my own way and I will, I will follow my agenda no matter what, right? And that goes to bad places as well. Because then you have the situation of my friend getting pulled in a hundred different directions by a hundred different ropes with a hundred different agendas. It's someone being exclusive of everyone else. Not the group being exclusive. It's me being exclusive at your expense. It has a downside. Which is to say that our unity is threatened by our sinfulness, our brokenness, our desire to follow our own way. When Jesus prays for unity, he's asking for it as a gift, and that's what it is. Unity is a gift, 
It's the work of the spirit of the risen Christ in us and through us and around us so that the world will know that they are loved. But like any gift, in order for it to be appreciated or used or for it to be of any good, you have to open it. You could have the best gift in the world and never open it, and it doesn't do you any good. We're asked, called to open this gift. It's a gift that requires some, um, some, some assembling. Now, to, to assemble the gift of unity, we need some specific tools. We need confession. We need some humility that there's a possibility, small though it is, that I might be wrong, that you might be right, that God is speaking through you, and I have to be open to that. I have to sometimes admit that I have my blind spots, and I need to be humble enough to confess that I might be wrong. You should have seen some of the looks I got from the pews earlier this morning at a different church when I talked about you might have to admit that you might be wrong. And there were these couples that were looking at each other like, he's talking about you. And both of them were looking at the other one saying, he's talking about you. Of course, I'm talking about the other one. Confession, humility. The other thing is a willingness to let go and a willingness to give in out of love, right? That love really is the de determining factor in our unity, in our direction, in our pulling, to give up something that I might even feel strongly about for the sake of another. Compromise. Discernment. Seeking God's will together. That the kingdom of God really is big enough for us all. And actually believing that. Not just playing a game but actually believing that God's love is big enough to include everyone. And by believing that and living that, a message is sent to the world. The other danger is this, that we're so afraid of disunity that we don't pull in any direction, that we don't pull at all, that we set down and say, we're not going anywhere, right? Instead of risking disunity, we won't do a thing. Ha! <laughs> Solve that. And that's a problem too, isn't it? Because we see how that works. Nothing goes anywhere. When our daughter was young, not that she's old now, <laughs> when our daughter was younger, we got, I got her a book, a book of poetry. A book of poetry by a kind of a quirky poet by the name of Shel Silverstein. Really quirky guy, but he had this way of creating poetry that spoke to kids in odd ways. And adults, if you happen to read his poetry as an adult, because it was for kids of all ages. And the book that I got her was Where the Sidewalk Ends. And Shel Silverstein included in that book this poem. I will not play at tug of war. I'd rather play at hug of war, where everyone hugs instead of tugs, where everyone giggles and rolls on the rug, where everyone kisses and everyone grins and everyone cuddles and everyone wins. 
I pray, gracious Father, that they may be one as we are one. May the risen Lord have his prayer answered. Thanks be to God. I don't think we've done this one before. Would you be willing to do that, Carol? It is Make Us One. It is from number 224 in the Sing the Faith hymn book. Um, it's not long, and I don't think it's especially hard, but we just haven't done it before. Thanks. Maybe we could sing through it twice, huh? Get better at it the second time. Friends, I invite you to join your hearts and minds and spirits together with me in a time of prayer. As we look around us, God, we are convinced not only of the beauty of your creation, but the wisdom in the design of everything that you do. <laughs> we look around and we see all kinds of diversity, wonderful, curious, wild, strange, beautiful, all kinds of diversity, and yet we also see, God, that in that diversity there is a plan, there is a purpose, there is something deep and life-giving going on in the midst of it all because everything and everyone is connected to everything else. It doesn't matter. The atoms in our bodies are connected to the stars. The DNA of which we are made is the same DNA of the frog that hops around the pond. The ones whose eyes we look into, whether we do so out of fear or love, are your children made by you, designed by you, gifted by you, so that we might all be a gift to one another. Hasten the day, gracious God, when that is so, when people set aside the things that get us twisted and turned around, reorder our priorities, fill us with so much love that it spills over. Help us in our common life together to discern your will so that we, in our following Jesus, might imagine a way to pull together that gives you glory, that makes us our best self, and that serves your purposes in the world. Help us to be better caretakers of this wildly divergent, yet wonderfully collective place. Give us a larger vision to see your larger world, the only home we have. Could that God, 
be an antidote for hate and fear? Could that be an antidote for war and aggression and greed? We pray so. And Jesus, Jesus, Jesus wants us to pray like that. Gracious and loving God, we pray as we bring sisters and brothers, strangers and neighbors into your presence. We rejoice with those who rejoice today, those who have found love, those who have been healed of disease, those who look forward to marriage and the birth of children, those who have meaningful work and happy families, those who have safe and happy homes those who worship you in freedom. We give you thanksgiving, God, for generations past that pulled together for those that have served in ways that were sacrificial and costly. We give you thanksgiving for the veterans among us and for the way they have served for the purpose of freedom. But we also pray, God, for others who serve, nurses, doctors, teachers, daycare workers, the people who do the things that make life possible, even if we take it for granted. The people that work so that something happens when we turn on the faucet or flip a switch. Help us, God, to be reverent in our consideration of service. And we pray for those who weep, for those who are sick in their bodies or minds or spirits. We pray, God, for those who have been devastated by the collateral damage of broken hearts and minds and lives, of those who may have believed lies and acted on them. We pray for a nation that continues to grieve over and over and over again because of the violence we inflict within our borders. We weep today, God, for those who do not have meaningful work, for struggle, who struggle for ways to use their gifts who have been forced from their homes. Be close, God, to us all this day, on this special weekend, when we celebrate community and freedom, help us to remember ever so mindfully and to use our energy and gifts to make community worth living in. For we would ask this and pray this, and the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God gives freely. God gives graciously, God gives abundantly, and we are the recipients of that all. In response to God's graciousness, I invite you to join with me in a prayer that dedicates what you have brought to share with God for God's holy purposes. Let us pray. Gracious and giving God, you are the one who has first given us all that we need for life.
for all who suffer want of our wor- of your word and for nurturing faith in your people. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our closing hymn this morning, friends, is number 306 in the glory to God. Blessed be the tie that bind. As you follow the journey of discipleship into the Easter world of God's grace, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And may God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you always, always. 